Hi, welcome to the show. This is Getting High on Anthropology. My name is Marty Otanias. I'm the host and producer. I want to um, mention today's show is episode 50. So this is a celebration. It's a celebration of the cannabis sector. It's a celebration of the idea that those of us involved with the show, guests in the past and the future, it's trying to make uh, the cannabis sector work better for more people. And so in addition to hosting the show, I'm also a professor at the University of Colorado Denver in the anthropology department. In uh, May semester 2018, I administer a course called Cannabis Culture, and in the course there are about 10 students, and part of the course involves story sharing, and this uh, semester, in May semester 2018, we produced uh, stories about cannabis culture defined broadly. So for episode 50, we're gonna run um, several of the videos, then talk with some of the students about the projects and what cannabis means to them. So before we begin and, t and run the videos and talk about them, I wanna first thank all all the students for being willing to learn about digital storytelling, learn about Premiere and develop some basic proficiency in video editing, and of course being willing to share their own narratives and their own uh, personal experiences as it relates to cannabis uh, defined broadly. So digital storytelling is a process and a product. It involves a creation of a story about 400 words, usually with a story prompt, and then after some polishing that, word, that uh, text, that script gets recorded and then students pick uh, imagery, whether still photographs or video excerpts, and then they assemble the video inside a video editing program and export it into a two or three minute video. And so I like the process and product of digital storytelling because it adds to the skills that students already bring to the table. So of course people learn to read and write really well beginning in kindergarten, but the intervention of digital storytelling allows people to learn some of the visual tools, not just the production of visual imagery, but also how do you look at and evaluate and assess visual imagery. So we're here at Denver Open Media because I really enjoy the philosophy of community media, citizen journalism, and of course us taking possession of the tools to tell stories that we think are important. If you haven't come to Denver Open Media, definitely check it out. There's a bunch of courses, incredible facility for creating media and basically creating stories that you think are important and to make sure that you are in control of the narrative and not other people. So I also want to thank, in addition to the students, we have some audience members here. I appreciate them taking the time and joining us today. We're going to run each of the stories, and in between, we'll talk with the students about their experiences in digital storytelling. These people outside, they must be high or something. They keep acting crazy, but I guess it's okay since marijuana and getting high is legal now, right? I remember my mother thinking out loud as she looked outside from our kitchen window. Hey mom, what does it mean to get high? I asked. Out of everything she said, the phrase marijuana promotes crime because people cannot think right is what I clearly remember because it was then that I understood that I was not to ever get near this crazy drug. Only bad people use marijuana, I heard from friends, family, and teachers around me. As time went by, more and more people I knew, including close friends, began to use marijuana. This meant that my best friend and others were off limits to hang out with, according to my mom. What's the big deal? Why do my friends and others consume weed if it's so bad? I began to research online and started asking lots of more questions. Does marijuana have any medical benefits? What are marijuana's negative health effects? How is marijuana different from alcohol and crack? As I began educating myself about cannabis, my mom said, ¿Por qué quieres aprender de eso? ¿Acaso tú usas? ¿Quieres destruir tu vida? Why all the accusations? All I want to do is educate myself on this drug that many people say it's harmful, but at the same time many others rely on to heal themselves. It is not like I'm doing anything wrong. Have you not taught me to educate myself on drugs and their effects? No one is hesitant to teach us about alcohol and crack, so what is so wrong with weed? I remember arguing. Cannabis as a medicine took on a new meaning for me during my sophomore year in high school. My friends suffered from seizures, and no one but I knew it. Move everything around him so that he does not get hurt and let's turn him on his side. I remember telling everyone while I held his head and passed my hand through his hair. Years later, I heard he tried cannabis for his condition, 
until this day, he will tell you that it has been life-changing. The problem with cannabis as a medicine is that more research is needed because of a history of research focused on the negative effects of cannabis. I am hopeful that more studies are being done to fully understand the positive effects of cannabis and offer arguments against cannabis as a devil's drug. With all this new information I have acquired through the past few years, I am a more informed potential consumer and positioned to have a more informed conversation about cannabis with my mom and others who oppose cannabis. In fact, it was not that long ago that my mother and I had a conversation on explaining to young children what cannabis is and discussed why that is an important conversation to have. A lot more kids nowadays see their parents use cannabis, whether it is for recreational or medical purposes. It is important that kids begin to understand that their parents using cannabis is not necessarily a bad thing, but that they do need to treat it as another thing that they are not allowed to touch or play with. We need to open the conversation because that is how we avoid accidents, I said. It made me feel good when she heard me out and calmly replied, I do not encourage anyone to consume it, but I do see your point. It was at that moment that I understood that that particular response might have just been the first step in the right direction. Adriana, the creator of that video, is unable to join us today. Uh, her sister's graduating from high school, so she's there. Um, and so congratulations, Adriana. The piece was a good one to start with, just to get people to understand the principles behind digital storytelling. Again, these are not documentary films, and they're different than uh, producing an academic paper at the end of a semester. The skills students learn, it's, again, story sharing, uh, putting a story on paper, recording, learning, learning how to edit, and then learning how to find the right image Images. Now, in any course, and especially a multimedia heavy course like the one I teach called Cannabis Cultures at CU Denver, uh, one of the problems is time deficiency. So with her piece, uh, like some other students, one of the best ways to get images is from the internet. So the internet issue is a bit problematic because some of the stuff is obviously copyrighted. Um, and there's copyright free material. And one website that's really good is archive.org out of San Francisco. It's basically a repository of all the material on the internet. So one of the problems with archive.org is uh, the material is not original, meaning the student themselves didn't create it. So sometimes when I teach the semester, I provide more, um, when I teach digital storytelling in a semester, I, I provide latitude to students to go onto archive.org or other places to find imagery. But in a dream world, it's better with sufficient time where students create the imagery themselves uh, by using photography or drawing it themselves or getting video excerpts. Uh, the other thing that was nice about that clip which is really important to, to recognize, is that these are not documentary films. These are first-person narratives. And so it's kind of nice and refreshing um, to spend time and uh, share experiences in this format as opposed to just writing a 15-page paper about some topic that is um, relevant to cannabis. So um, that was the first story. And again, thank you, Adriana. So we're going to run a second story. And in between um, the subsequent stories, we're going to have the students come up and we'll talk briefly about each of them. This is me. I'm goofy and crazy all on my own. I'm one of the most indecisive, overthinking 21-year-olds out there. Everything has to be perfect. For a long time, ignorance defined my view on marijuana. It is a drug and I'm crazy enough without it. But as I've become more educated through conversation and my cannabis culture class, my view is changing. I'm more open to the idea of experimenting with cannabis, but I'm waiting for that perfect moment. I'm essentially treating my first high as some do their virginity. Most of my extended family members live in Michigan. During one of my visits, I got to see my mom's oldest brother, Uncle Gary. Gary was always my favorite uncle when I was young. He would talk to the TV and I thought that was so interesting. He loved to watch WWE, particularly the wrestler John Cena. The announcer would ask the audience, are you ready to rumble? 
and my uncle would respond, thinking the announcer was trying to directly communicate with him. He'd watch the fight and congratulate his best friend on winning. My mom told me that Uncle Gary was schizophrenic. It's what made him believe that the people from the television were speaking with him as if they knew him. Why is he like this? I asked my mom. She said that Gary went to Woodstock and did drugs. She made it very clear that I was never to do drugs of any kind. My mom is a pharmacist and I trust what she said. Woodstock is associated with drugs like marijuana and it turned me off to the idea of cannabis. I thought that if I smoked pot, I could end up just like my uncle. In high school, I was involved in the highest level academic classes and I participated in sports like cross country, track and field, and cheerleading. As a serious athlete, especially a runner and the cheer captain, I felt that smoking marijuana could inhibit me and detract from my ability to perform at my best capability. I was labeled as a goody two-shoes. And after turning my friends down on their invitation to drink and smoke with them one too many times, I soon saw that I was left uninvited. But once I got to college, that all changed. I started my college career in August of 2015 in San Marcos, Texas at Texas State University. One time, a guy from a nearby frat asked me about Colorado. We talked about our love for the Rocky Mountains and he asked me about what I thought of Colorado legalizing marijuana. I told him that I didn't smoke and he seemed disappointed. He asked why and I told him that I was waiting to go back to Colorado the following summer and go backpacking with my two brothers. Since they both consume a pretty good amount of cannabis, they'd be the perfect guides. We'd all be up there with the beautiful scenery, the warm crackling fire in front of us, and be surrounded by stars. It would just be the most perfect experience. I'd explain how I'm comfortable with my brothers and I felt that it was important for me to have them there for my first high. Consuming cannabis is my decision. I don't owe anyone an explanation as to why I choose not to consume cannabis and that doesn't make me any less of a person. As I grow older, I am developing a different mindset on how I view cannabis. I've gone from being completely closed off to the subject to being a little more curious and almost welcoming the idea of getting high. I continue to treat my first high as I would losing my virginity, and I still hope for that perfect moment. All right, you just watched a digital story produced by a student in my course called Cannabis Culture in the Anthropology Department at UC Denver. Uh, this, the student is with us today. Uh, her name is Allie, and it's a treat to have you up on stage and talk with you about your video. So you watched it on the big screen. So what did you think about it as you saw it? Oh man, that was certainly something. Um, it was great having, you know, I've, I've grown to really like my classmates and I feel that in a class such as this cannibal cannabis culture class in um, UC Denver in your setting, it's, it's um, opened a great opportunity to have such a um, open conversation with classmates who come from different backgrounds, especially with such a um, difficult topic, I guess. Uh, having it up there was, you know, self-conscious. I'm watching myself and I'm thinking maybe I could have chosen a different way to introduce myself than other than, you know, stuck rolling around in a tire, but <laughs> I think it explained my message very well. So it was, it was really fun. It was a good project. Well, I really appreciate be you being willing to share some of the imagery because you have this really powerful imagery of you as a little girl with your uncle. Yeah. So, so tell me about that experience, your uncle, and just, you know, having that mental health illness in your family. Um, so is it, how does it feel telling that story? And is it something you think others maybe at least can start to talk about openly, um, you know, mental health issues? Yeah, that was, um, that was something that I don't have a lot of information about, so I don't completely know the whole story with my uncle. Um, from a young age, my parents would told, they told me that he did, he was that way because he did drugs. And then I learned that he went to Woodstock and then I learned what Woodstock was. And then I learned that before he went to Woodstock, he had some psychosis. So this was something that he had had. Um, so I think that as far as 
talking about that in this class and for this project was a little difficult just because it's not entirely related to cannabis use. But I think that um, at least with my research from this class, that's been really influential and I've learned a lot about whether or not cannabis can link to developing psychoses and developing other mental illnesses, um, even, even just other health defects. Jay, one of the students asked about um, um, Allie's uncle and about uh, a little bit more about her um, opinion or view about mental health. Um, yeah, so Uncle Gary, he was always so loving and he, he loved me and my brothers more than anything else. Um, just the fact that he had schizophrenia didn't really affect that relationship and that ability to love us or care for us or have those experiences with us. Um, I think that he definitely had a very mild case of schizophrenia, so it was just the talking to the television and, you know, joking around that, well, he wasn't joking, but he thought Mariah Carey was his wife, and it was, you know, funny to us, so I don't think that it ever occurred to me or made me think, oh, he's, he's got a disorder, he has a mental illness, he's any different, I should treat him any different. And Allie, during the screening, I saw you laugh at one particular part in the video. <laughs> so you laughed when the, the pie got crushed in the face. So yeah. tell me about your response to that or, or what was going on around that time. So it's funny. That is a clip from, um, I'm very good friends with this individual, uh, but we had just gotten into an argument like a week before. <laughs> so I used this great fundraising opportunity. I bought this pie for a dollar and I threw it in his face. And I thought that it was a good... Um, obviously he, he was in a fraternity he had his Theta Chi on his his jersey so I thought it fit very well in my story but um, yeah I laughed because it was not necessarily the story was or the image wasn't necessarily relevant to the story <laughs> yeah and I think um, that image is really emblematic of that, the challenge with these pieces because what yeah. we want to do is have the narrative flow and be really heartfelt and touching and then of course get images that are somehow related and sometimes yeah. they don't relate uh, the, the way digital storytelling works is that the audio is or should be able to run on its own and so the visual imagery is sort of just a cherry on top yeah. but we could agree we work together closely we've had a couple keen of you brought in some old footage but I think you putting yourself up there especially being young and uh, you know with your your uncle it worked really well and you being playful in the tire I, I just really <laughs> love that at the beginning so again thank you and I hope you continue doing this kind of creative work and again appreciate you willing to share this story yeah thank you very much okay so with that we're gonna run um, a, another digital story and I hope you enjoy this one created by a student in the course cannabis culture at CU Denver I was born and raised in Colorado, the cannabis state. My parents are your typical strict Asian parents that never let their kids do anything but study. Any discussions about being an artist, dating, or drugs were forbidden and never talked about. When parents tell you not to do something, it makes you want to break the rules and just go for it. My favorite cousin was a role model for me. He was also a pothead who provided me with my first experience with weed. Though I was young and unfamiliar with how to use a pipe, it was a great experience that I hold dearly in my memory. While I enjoyed these times, my focus turned to school because I wanted to become a doctor or a dentist. My parents influenced my career goals and helped me to do well in school to eventually become an honor roll student. However, I noticed one day that my best friend Sean was ditching class on a regular basis. He smoked often and stopped doing homework. As I neared the end of high school as a time for partying and prepping for graduation, Sean, who smoked daily, told me about how he was struggling to pass in his classes. Maybe Sean and other friends of mine were rebellious. More than one friend of mine had a difficult time completing high school. Some failed. Since I'm very science oriented, I think I was subconsciously doing an observational study on my friends, comparing how often my friends needed to smoke to how well they did in school. This might be because I was heavily influenced by my father who is a doctor. He was the one who introduced me to the science field. My cousin Vin was an exception. Being a major pothead, he was still an honor roll student and president of several clubs. 
In May Mester 2018, I learned that marijuana has addictive properties that researchers have shown that consumers of cannabis demonstrate a decline in academic performance. However, many different factors played a part in each of my friends' lives, so it's unfair to say that smoking marijuana leads to poor academic performance and addiction. My friends mean a lot to me, and though I learned that cannabis may have an influence on education and life chances, I think it's still perfectly fine if individuals consume cannabis on a moderate basis. It's obvious that additional research is needed on the effects of smoking cannabis, such as addiction and cognitive impairment. Also, more studies are needed to examine how chronic users of cannabis are able to live successful lives. Are you a cannabis user who is a functioning individual? All right, Kenny, great work. So why don't you introduce yourself and what message do you want people to get from your video? Uh, so my name's Kenny Tran and I'm a biology major and I'm looking to become a doctor or a dentist or just something in the med field. So um, what, what you said, like, what's the, my message? Um, so the message I would want to like send out there is that I think that using cannabis is uh, well and it's, it's good if used in moderation and that there still needs to be a lot of research done on like the effects of marijuana on like the body but i think that all there's all the signs are pointing to that marijuana can be used as a medicine so that's a mess or right. that's the message i want to send great well again thank you for sharing um any questions or comments or observations for kenny from the audience members so kenny the question is what is your cousin doing now uh, my cousin, he uh, went into CSU for computer science. So right now he's about to graduate and he's just looking for a job soon. And then briefly, is there one image or excerpt from your video that stands out and, and tell us why? Um, so the photo with me and my best friend uh, that was taken recently. And like he is like living his life. He's traveling. He's getting married already. Like I know that even though he smokes a lot still to this day he uh, is living his life in his own way and it's not any less than mine and it's not any more successful or more like he has been he's traveling all over the world and I'm here studying so different paths but overall uh, I think that it's okay that he still smokes and that is has not negatively affected his life Excellent. Thanks again, Kenny. And congratulations on completing the project and the course. Right, thank you. All right, we're going to watch another digital story produced by a student in the course Cannabis Culture in the Anthropology Department at UC Denver. I served in the United States Army from October 2010 to May 2014. It is one of the hardest jobs a person will have to do. I was a 91 Alpha, a neighboring systems maintainer, a tank mechanic. The blank check I signed to the United States government loomed over my head. I did not see combat, but I did experience some harsh environments and bad and good leadership. This, as well as poor decision making and a poor marriage, contributed to my team chief and a mental health professional listing me as having non combat induced PTSD. I include myself in the number of service members and civilians who have suffered trauma in some way or form, such as car accidents, domestic violence incidents, and sexual assaults. These experiences may induce post traumatic stress disorder in a person, causing the individual to seek help. The cure or road to recovery usually takes form of psychological help, prescribed medicines, and antidepressants. However, the synthetic drugs tend to suppress a person's mental trauma. It is understood that the antidepressants are a band-aid. For some, speaking to a professional therapist may help, though it runs the risk of re-traumatizing people. Sometimes the mix of opioids and therapy does not help at all, and it forces change in a person. Anger, depression, seclusion, inability to connect with people are some of the things that can aggravate PTSD symptoms. My symptoms are anger, distrust, seclusion, and the inability to reconnect with people outside my close personal circle of friends. While my symptoms are not derived from PTSD caused by combat or loss of limb or traumatic injury, they still influence my day-to-day -day mental wellness. To me, the military means family, and I have been touched by the various service members who took their own lives due to PTSD. I myself was almost among the 22. This was the number of veterans, according to the VA in 2013, who committed suicide per day. A couple of years back, while I was active duty and after being pushed to the brink to a broken marriage and job-related stress, I thought about taking my own life with a borrowed 22 caliber rifle. 
Now, though, when I look back on these personal problems, they're trivial. They clearly left an imprint on my personal identity, though. Many veterans and I believe that the Department of Veteran Affairs is not doing enough to properly take care of us when we exit the military. This needs to change. Part of the change may, the, may be the availability of low-cost or free medical cannabis. I'm not a user of marijuana, medical or recreational, but I do know many people, friends, roommates, and fellow veterans who've consumed cannabis to help with chronic pain, anxiety, and the emotional turmoil. It seems perfectly reasonable to ensure individuals in need should have the options, especially natural and non-addictive ones. Nick Eden, a former Navy, Navy SEAL and a founder of the Veterans Cannabis Project, agrees with me. He educates people on how marijuana is helpful in medicine for veterans and how it is more effective than the pills the VA prescribes. In 2018, the VA says it wants to help study how marijuana can alleviate PTSD among veterans. Since marijuana is a Schedule I drug and is illegal in the eyes of the federal government, the VA is unable to officially conduct cannabis PTSD studies. This obstacle does not stop veterans from using medical, medical cannabis, though vets consuming it understand that they are at risk at losing their military disability benefits. I am a soldier, a student, and a citizen. I stand with vets and others who desire cannabis to address problems of PTSD. It's been four years since I moved from Cincinnati to Denver. My homie Kate is back in Ohio. We still talk on a regular basis and reminisce about our high school days. Each time I visit Ohio, it seems as though nothing has changed with her and I. When I arrive at the airport, she's the one who picks me up in her dirty old blue pickup truck. I instantly feel a sense of nostalgia as I sit in the front seat. The stench of freshly sweaty yoga clothes thrown in the back is hard to ignore as I close my eyes and smile to myself. Without hesitation, Kate lights up a joint and hands it to me. Moments later, we arrive to her apartment and I collapse on the couch. I feel at ease. Her presence tends to do that to me. This is home. Kate has been my best friend since we were 16. We were the rebels of our all-girls Catholic high school. So, of course, we were each other's smoking buddies. During lunch break at school, we would escape down the street where my car was parked and take a couple hits of my bowl. These occasions helped Kate and I to unwind from the demands of society. We would speak on the concepts of quantum physics and dwell on the possibilities that the future would hold. Our unruly style clearly stood out from the hundreds of girls around us who wore Vera Bradley and North Face brands every day. Kate's bedroom in her mom's house was an escape for me. I was able to delve into a world that I had not previously known. Since I was a little girl, I was taught by my mother and Catholic school teachers that I needed to be someone that I felt was unattainable. I discovered cannabis, which eased the anxieties and demands indoctrinated into my life. I spent my summers at Kate's house in her eclectic room with incense smoking, chill, etheric music in the distance, and a joint in my hand. Kate and I painted pictures, played the piano, and created rhythms with the bongos. We climbed on the roof which overlooked Montana Avenue. We would make beautiful meals for ourselves and carry on conversation that permitted me to independently make decisions and generate more acceptance and alternative views of cannabis in particular. Kate's mom and her stepdad, John, we're always downstairs smoking their own weed and would often share amongst us. In that house, there were no expectations and no judgments. It became clear to me that people around me were uniquely human and I started to understand what authenticity truly meant. To me, marijuana is a driving force that changed my perception of the community around me. I consumed cannabis because it gave me a different perspective on how my life could be lived. With newfound insights into human coexistence, I felt a harmonizing sense of belonging. Cannabis made me feel a part of something bigger. I was liberated. Sophia, how'd you like watching your video on the big screen? Um, yeah, it's a little weird at first because it's like my voice, you know, I don't, it's different. Um, but I feel uh, proud of myself for completing that. 
And then what about the process of story writing? So mm -hmm. every student in the class had to write uh, based on one of four prompts. So what was that process like, or what advice would you give to someone if they were going to do it, let's say, next semester? Yeah, um, I guess mine, from what I started with until what it is now, kind of strayed a little w a diff uh, way from the original prompt. But that really helped initiate a spark into, um, you know, a different way of thinking about cannabis in an academic sense. Um, and then turning it into, along with your personal account, you can make it more... Um, inviting for others to watch. And then you're one of the few students in the class that is doing an anthropology minor. Mm -hmm. So how does this connect at all to anthropology? Yeah, um, I'm just really interested in the cultural aspects and the different perspectives that people have. Um, as you can see in my video, I it was a contrast of, of my um, bringing up and the, and the culture behind um, the way you know, my parents had our, our family, a dynamic, and it was uh, very religious and, you know, conservative, whereas later on in my life, I found that there's different ways to live. And, and uh, that's what's really enriching with anthropology is because uh, you can really get to see um, different perspectives and um, ways of life. Excellent. Yeah. Well, of course, I'd love to see you pursue master's PhD in yeah. anthropology. Yeah. Uh, and so I appreciate the work you did on this story, especially sharing that relationship, the bonding mm -hmm. uh, with you and your friend. Uh, so any questions or comments uh, from people in the audience for uh, Sophia? So um, one of the questions was, what's <laughs> your favorite record to uh, listen to when you're smoking a joint? Yeah, um, honestly, we were always spinning different genres. Um, I mean, always like a Bob Dylan, that we would always listen to Bob Dylan. Uh, it was just anything and everything, open to everything. <laughs> and the question is very important because um, when I instruct students about using the digital storytelling methodology, the music, the instrumental song is a character in the video. Mm -hmm. And so tell us about your music selection. Yeah, I mean, it was just a really easy going kind of background music, nothing in particular. I, um, I found it on, on that website um, and it just sounded uh, easily, uh, it was easy for the ears and I could speak on it without it getting too distracted. So. Excellent. And you think you'll show Kate the final video? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, she'll love it. <laughs> Good. Um, Sophia, thanks again. I really appreciate the work you did and of course again for you and others, congratulations for finishing the project and the course. Thank you. All right, we're going to run another digital story. I um, hope you enjoy it. High school seems like so long ago. I remember it as if it was yesterday. I tried hard alcohol a handful of times and remember drinking natural ice when my friends and I could convince someone to buy for us. Getting caught drinking by my parents was never as scary as the thought of being caught smoking weed. My sister was the straight-A student. I believed that C's get degrees. May 2010, I graduated high school. You may know me as the person who never consumed weed. At the same time, I had an angel on my shoulder saying, good job, and a devil on the other side saying, try it, it won't kill you. Freshman year, I moved into the dorms, Chank and Saul at Sacramento State. Can I complete college and stay cannabis free? The two girls next door to me became good friends. We went to house parties and ate at the dining hall hungover. Living in the city of trees, my friends and I saw weed everywhere. It was unavoidable that at some point I would experiment with cannabis. April 20th rolls around. What better day than the national holiday for stoners to try weed? In my dorm room, my friends and I stuffed towels at the bottom crack of the door and kept the dusty windows pried open. I gently held this for an object and experienced a few unwanted coughs. I consumed cannabis and thought, how am I going to feel? When is it going to hit me? Smoking with Jessica and Gracie in our dorm rooms didn't happen every day, though when it did occur, we tried our best not to get caught. One night, we thought our luck ran out. It was Friday Eve freshman year in the dorm rooms. We were elevating ourselves, laughing our asses off. Knock, knock, knock comes from the door. We stop everything immediately. I panic and spray Febreze. Gracie opens the door and sees Stacy, the resident advisor, aka the wannabe dorm police. What are you doing? Stacy asks. In a shaky voice, Gracie responds, just hanging out. Stacy seems to believe us and she leaves. Trying hard not to laugh, Gracie shuts the door and turns to us with a look on her face. How the hell did Stacy believe we weren't smoking weed? Poor Stacy, so innocent and nice, always believing my friends and I were doing the right thing. It
It's now 2018. I live in Denver, Colorado. Cannabis consumption is something that works for me for medicinal purposes. A mix of THC and CBD eases my migraines and helps me focus when I do homework. While I have no need for hotboxing in the dorm room and misleading people like Stacy, I view legalization as a key element in my cannabis culture. Sarah is with us. She's a student at, who created the video. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you. So maybe um, introduce yourself and then tell us about your video. What's the one message you want people to get? Um, I am, I just actually recently moved to Denver um, here past, this past August. Um, born and raised in Sacramento. Um, and I am studying communications. And um, with the limited classes um, that were offered for Maymester, um, cannabis culture most definitely caught my eye. Um, having to tell my parents that was the class I was spending money on to take um, was, a, was a little bit of a struggle. Um, but I, putting this video together, um, I had a different thought of what I wanted to share. Um, and then hearing other classmates, this memory um, in the dorms sparked my interest. Um, and Stacy, I won't ever forget her. Won't ever forget what she looked like. Um, and I just want people to understand um, that you can consume um, cannabis and be a functioning human um, and get things done and really wanting to take that stigma that negative stigma away from our society um, and realizing that cannabis can be used for um, medicinal purposes um, i use it for migraines and to focus on um, being able to complete all my homework and i do still work um, 30 hours a week. So using that versus um, relying on pills um, or prescribed medication um, is a message that I want more people to understand um, and hear more about. Great. What I appreciate about what you just said is um, you communicating, speaking with peers in the class. So the digital storytelling process is not just about the end goal of producing a video, but the process of, work, of us uh, instructor and students creating a community of practice, uh, working through the narratives, working through the technical, you know, obligatory technical problems. And so, um, you know, the fact that we were able to share each other's stories and talk about the kinks is really important and fundamental to the process. So would you do anything differently? Like if you were to redo it, any one or two changes? Um, I hate the sound of my voice. Um, I hate hearing that. Um, but maybe a couple things I would take out maybe a couple things I would add in um, but no I uh, Stacy man she uh, won't ever forget her so. and of course um, what I like about working with you and your story when we had the moment of us as a group sharing the ideas for the story uh, you and the time that you shared was when we had the most laughter because uh, the memories that it conjured up with yourselves and just the general fun time that you had. So I, I hope, um, you know, maybe one day Stacy and people like her will see this just to uh, be able to laugh at it and look back and find it humorous. And so I'm curious, what's the future for you in terms of um, where you're going with your education and anything related to cannabis at all? Um, I am actually waiting to hear back um, for a internship for the fall um, with the Department of Corrections um, as a mentor. Um, and I would be working in four different prisons um, here in Colorado and mentoring um, these inmates. And so if I get to share a story and help them, I'm hoping that they share their story. Um, and it would be interesting to hear how many people are in there um, that is cannabis related. Excellent. Well, good luck with that. I hope you keep Thank in you. touch and congratulations again on the project and, and the completing the chorus. Thank you. I was with a close friend of mine roaming around the neighborhood of Lakeway, just seeing what the day offered. We were walking through the woods on the golf course. Walking in nature early in fall offers an array of wonderful aromas. This day was unique. An aroma began to permeate my nostrils so strongly that my heart rushed to the curiosity it sparked in me. Six beautiful, budding, mature marijuana plants sat before us. The ganja was perched in the most perfect solitary grass offering that there was in this thick cedar forest. Just over the plants was a seemingly perfect skylight, organically installed. The plants were in 10-gallon pots filled with soil. On the ground very near the plants were fertilizer containers. Years later, at a grocery store, I would get flashbacks from a side of these same brands, formulated especially for weed. 
I would recall looking down at one bottle, the image of a ferocious tiger surrounded by large jungle plants that read, Tiger Bloom, a flowering plant supplement. I don't use the stuff, but I always smile when I see that tiger. I asked my friend who pretended to be surprised, but in those moments I knew many things somehow instantaneously. Thoughts like, whose Mary is this? Shit, we should go. This is dangerous. When we walked out of that brush and around the road, our luck shifted. Minutes later at the roadside, my friend's older brother pulled up in his car with his friends. They had spotted us and were pulling up alongside us slowly. These guys were the caretakers of this field and they were none too happy to see us, suspiciously exiting the woods a few hundred yards from their crop. The interrogation they gave my friend and I was intense. What are y'all doing on the golf course? That's the long way around from your place. We promptly denied anything that would hint at their plants. I didn't see marijuana plants growing again until the summer going into my sophomore year of high school. I was invited out to a friend's house in the more rural neighborhood of Spicewood, Texas, where Willie Nelson has his ranch. Anyways, the pot was doing great out there. Heat was the only thing getting to it. The summer sun in Texas can be brutal, but sativa plants can tolerate it. Some deer snacked on the plants once, but Spencer put a fence up real quick. After that, it was all good. Hooked on growing since before I was even able to, I bought books on the subject and obsessed over any information I could find. It wasn't until after graduating high school that I established my own grow and I finally got to harvest a homegrown crop. These plants used to speak to me all the time. They'd say things like, Thomas, we're way too hot in here, you asshole. Or feed us. The longest talks I felt like was in the early days. I was so enamored I would sit with them for hours, gently tending to them as if they were children. The conversations improved over the years as I got better at growing. Well-fed and cared for plants usually just smile. I learned how to keep them as happy and as prosperous as they kept me. The relationship with these girls has always been a symbiotic one. While smoking cannabis is great, nothing will ever beat the thrill and satisfaction of the hunt. Top of the water in so a finance major taking a cannabis class. Yes. Um, so working in the cannabis industry in the past, one of the things that I saw that was very common um, was sort of a, a low standardization of skill sets and therefore uh, not really like a good establishment of job security. And I feel like finance is a sort of a good way to go into what I view as sort of a, a weaker part of the industry right now because so much regulation and things constantly changing. Um, I thought that that might give me sort of a competitive advantage amongst uh, some of the other candidates that might have, you know, experience that correlates more directly. Excellent. And we talked about maybe the future of the business school having a few more or starting some cannabis classes. Sure, that'd be sure. great. Yeah, that and would you'd be, welcome that. Absolutely. Yeah, that'd be something that'd be great to see because um, it's such a unique industry. Um, you know, like with alcohol, there's just so much red tape and there's so much uh, specialization to what it takes to operate in that industry. Um, it's it's really sort of a, a, a blind side for anybody that wants to operate inside the United States in a legal business when they don't really have any means of obtaining or figuring out how to do it until, you know, they're totally in over their head. So it'd be nice to have some kind of a preface to that. So in the narrative, and of course, the visual imagery suggests you have this fondness to cannabis. So tell me about your selection of imagery and what was going on there. Yeah, you know, it's, it's just a plant. Uh, that's what I like to think of it most as. It's a plant that s makes me very happy. Um, it seems to work for a lot of other people in a lot of different ways. Um, and the, the way that I look at cannabis, it's almost, it's a lot like music. Like everybody kind of will admit that they enjoy it in some way or another, but what it means for each person is super unique. And, um, for me, the experience of growing up and getting to see that and, you know, the guys that were involved with it, even when I was growing up there, it was always like the older brothers or like, you know, the cool guys that were, you know, that were growing these plants and doing the, this kind of stuff. But the, the reason they weren't doing it is because they were like trying to be badass. They were doing it because they wanted to be able to smoke pot later and that's illegal. And that's this whole charade of like going to buy drugs and all this thing is just so ridiculous because it's, it's just a plant. So when you walk across it in the woods, you know, as a young man, curiosity of it is naturally like really sparked by that. So excellent. And yeah. as you pointed out, it could be also dangerous. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's a little, uh, it's a little disarming when you come across something that you're certain is illegal. Excellent. <laughs> yeah. Well, let me open it up to any questions or comments from audience members. 
for Thomas was about the um, deer, what happened to the deer who ate the plant, and then also uh, this uh, notion of calling the girls, or calling the plants girls. So tell us about that, because there is a subtext to that of why you call them girls. Um, I believe the deer went on to write a series of uh, really well-selling novels. <laughs> um, the, the, the analogy when, when I call the plants the girls, it's really a direct thing, because sensimedia plants, like drug cannabis, uh, they're all female plants. So they, they are, uh, you know, they are females. They are the, the girls. And when, when you're constantly uh, in an environment where any kind of exposure to something questionable that you might, might regret later, uh, it's best probably not to be like, hey, how's the pot? How's the pot? You know, or like, how are your weed plants doing? Hey, man, I need to get some food for my weed plants. Like, it's just kind of frowned upon that language uh, in the industry anyway. It just it's 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 sort of obvious, you know, or like stating a double negative. It just doesn't sound right. So it's it's a lot easier just to refer to them as as the ladies. And then um, the student also commented on your shirt. So just uh, briefly tell us about your shirt. Yeah, I had this one made in South Padre Island. Uh, my folks have a beach house down there. So just anything I can do to embarrass them, you know, and kind of <laughs> share my beliefs with the rest of Texas while I'm while I'm back at home. Thomas, great job. We're going to watch the last digital story produced by uh, Jay. Hey, Jay, that stuff makes you a stupid into cabeza. Jenny, my ex-wife, is amazing. She is from Bogota, Colombia. She sounds like my high school health teacher who talks about the evils of alcohol, sex, and cannabis. I am unable to understand why Colombians and others across the world demonize marijuana. The United States and its prohibitionist ideology fails to convince me and other citizens that cannabis ruins your brain. Since age 14, I have used and loved cannabis. It helped calm the chaos of alcoholism and drugs, which were just a normal part of my family life. Being a daily user did not prevent me from achieving a 3.8 grade point average and graduating high school at the top 14% of my class. Having zero money for college, I joined the Air Force. My job was to balance a 500,000 pound airplane mathematically with my brain while flying 24 hour days. Loadmasters are required to know every dimension, every crack of the Boeing C-17 inside and out. I completed scary and highly dangerous missions. During routine airdrop missions, I opened the door in flight with a parachute on to drop food, water, and supplies to soldiers in remote locations in Afghanistan. I flew National Science Foundation scientists of all different backgrounds to Antarctica, where I filmed penguins less than five feet away from me. The 10 years I was in the Air Force, I was of course cannabis free. On the day my military contract ended, I restarted cannabis consumption. It was one of the happiest days of my life. I married Jenny as I was transitioning to becoming a land surveyor. Jenny and I moved to North Dakota where I was surveying some intense landscapes in sub-zero temps. I, Jay, I don't understand how you can a smoke and a smoke and a smoke and still do your notes. She's referring to my survey notes that I create, depicting whatever data I gathered for the day. I don't know either. I guess all of the science that says cannabis degrades your cognitive function is a conspiracy across the world, haha. -ha. I teased her. We relocated from North Dakota to Colorado to be closer to my son, for me to start college, and for low-cost medicinal cannabis. As an aviator, I was always nose deep inside of a map. This concept was only heightened as a surveyor, so it only made sense in my brain to study GIS, aka cartography. With many engineering ideas flowing through my brain, I chose to study computer automated drafting and design, with hopes of making the visions come to life. One such vision was of a Japanese gazebo. For my final class project, I found an inspirational pagoda online and designed my own 2D version of it. Being 25% German, and as Frankfurt is my birthplace, I have a huge affinity for castles. This love was only compounded by the fact that I flew missions out of Germany for a decade. I was able to see too many castles to count. I've even walked around the famous Disneyland castle, or rather, the new Schwanstein castle in Bavaria. This passion led me to obsess over how to design the best and smallest castle feasible, which also doubles as my future dream house when cannabis pays me big bucks one day. The castle I ended up creating helped pave my way to becoming a certified drafter designer. As a chemical engineer student, 
My brain is constantly filled with complex symbols, numbers, and equations. With free time, if not practicing the guitar or piano relentlessly, I'll be playing the app Chess with Friends throughout the day or hiking the creek vaping cannabis. Sadly, a large part of society would label me a stoner and think that stoners are flat out dumb or struggle with memory. Why can't the world see the good in cannabis or see beyond only medicinal purposes? I suppose it'll take me getting a PhD to help convince the people. Challenge accepted. Jay, a student at CU Denver, is the producer of that digital story. We have him here with us today. So Jay, your digital story has sort of two underlying messages. You're promoting a counter stereotype to the traditional stoner. And then it also seems that you're like putting out there this idea of higher education for you, especially cannabis themed, is something that you want to pursue. So tell us about one of those. What I wanted to portray was that when it comes to higher education was that um, actually those designs were all from my brain when my brain was on cannabis and at times I would sit in front of CAD for 12 to 16 hours doing some of those you know castles and uh, interior design works and just like controlling media uh, you know how it can be frustrating as a producer or an editor CAD is the same way and at times cannabis can alleviate that annoying stress that you get from and help and act as an artist or a designer to help maybe look at a different angle and so I love that you're promoting the positive potential of the cannabis high so in other words creativity mm -hmm. some deeper thought um, and then what about you and the process of, of with your fingers in the editing program did you enjoy it I did it actually felt a little bit like a version of CAD but a media version where uh, you were building something different and you were designing something uh, same concept it's just a different format so. and then you like some of the other students have a close relationship with cannabis what's the future hold for you in the short term um, in the short term it'll just be me finishing up chemical engineering degree hoping that this state eventually gets a de degree called medicinal plant chemistry so that I can study my master's as a medicinal plant chemist and then a PhD will be in agricultural hemp if since I'm Native American, they'll help me get my PhD. Um, ho hopefully, I won't have to open up a business until then, but if so, then maybe I get into the business of extracting and becoming an extraction uh, specialist. Excellent, thanks Jay. Let's open it up. Um, any questions or comments from audience members for Jay? Excellent, one of the members of the audience said they want to thank you for your service. Thank you. And I Thank think you. your video does a great job portraying your work that you did in the military. Uh, this is Getting High on Anthropology. My name is Marty Otanias, and you can find us at fsngreen.org. And we're here in Denver Open Media in Denver, Colorado. And uh, take care and have a great day. Candy Sidabaka. I am the co-founder and executive director of Project Voice in Denver. Um, I am also a member organization and resident of the Anti-Displacement Coalition in Swansea. We are currently in the Glowville neighborhood of Denver. Um, sometimes people refer to it as Rhino because of the art district overlay and this is one of the neighborhoods that has a disproportionate concentration of the marijuana industry in Colorado. Um, we are in, next to the neighborhood Swansea that has the highest concentration of the marijuana industry in Colorado. I live across the street from four grow houses and that kind of naturally sucked me into this world of advocacy because it wasn't my target area. It never was, and I never thought it would be. Um, I got involved because the first raid in Colorado by the DEA happened across the street from me. And um, it, the moments leading up to that raid were really um, scary for my family. My grandmother lived in my house and I was in DC when that raid happened and she 
had been telling me about people stopping at her house, knocking on the door, asking if she had seen the owners of the grow house. And she would tell them no, and they would get like really pushy with her and start accusing her of lying. And when the raid happened, we found out that there was a lot of bl uh, bad business happening there and that there was some trafficking. And the people that were looking for the business owners thought my grandma like would have known when and where they were. And so as my grandma watched them pull out the plants and throw the plants in the middle of the street and seize everything, I was on the phone with her trying to figure out how is this happening across the street from my grandma's house? What's going on? And I didn't quite understand the impact when she would tell me she can't go out on the porch anymore because she feels like she's getting high from the smells. And I just dismissed her. You know, she was old school, so I didn't pay attention until I moved back and experienced it myself. Um, I didn't realize how in how intense it was and I didn't realize what it was like to live across the street from this industry. And so when I experienced it firsthand, I didn't have a choice but to get involved. In Colorado, as pioneers of the legalization movement, we didn't put a lot of thought into protecting community. Um, we also didn't anticipate the influence of capitalism on legalization. Um, a lot of us who voted for legalization voted um, with a social justice frame of mind and we were really voting to decriminalize marijuana, not necessarily um, invite it into the capitalist system the way that it has been. And so when we were thinking about protecting community and over-policed communities, we weren't thinking about how legalization of this industry would change the face of our community and change the feeling in our community. And so gentrification right now, I believe, is very strongly connected to legalization, um, primarily because we're the sexy place in the country because of legalization. Lots of people are interested in being a part of this industry, whether for social justice reasons or for capitalist reasons. So we're the place where people are coming and we didn't equip ourselves to deal with that. The industry's grow facilities were limited to areas that were zoned for industry and in Denver that has historically been communities of color and communities that live in poverty. So now we have disproportionate concentrations of the industry in poor and minority communities. Gentrification is looking very different in our community because we're not seeing the fixing and flipping and scraping houses and uh, fugly houses popping up. We're seeing 68 to 72 percent increases in our property taxes and nothing visually is changing around us. Um, we're seeing fences go up and surveillance cameras on these buildings, but we're not seeing the same kind of gentrification and that's because every open space in our community is being eaten up by the marijuana industry.